a bunch. Thank you. Okay. So again, welcome back everybody to the Civics Project. I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. I'm Beth Rebay, the Director of Repair and the host of the Civics Project. Repair acknowledges the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Taraha Tome, the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to Hanuk Vatam, the ancestors, uh, Ahihiram, the elders, and Eohinkam, our relatives and relations past, present, and emerging. And our topic for today's session is the Electoral College. So the first thing I'd like to share with everybody is a brief section of the U.S. Constitution, specifically from Article 2, Section 1. I won't read through the entire article, just a few sentences to give you a sense of what the Constitution actually says about the electors and the Electoral College. So quoting directly from Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years and together with the vice president chosen for the same term be elected as follows. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress, but no senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. So, and that's the end of the subsection I'm going to read. read. It's mostly from clauses one through three in Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution. So today, the U.S. states each have between 3 and 55 electoral votes. The smallest states have exactly 3, and electors are determined for each vote's votes based on the number of people that they have in Congress. So each state gets two senators and two corresponding electoral votes, and the smallest states get just one representative and... Each of those states then gets a total of three electors. Our most populated state is California. California has 12% of the total U.S. population, and it gets its two senators and 53 representatives because representation in the House of Representatives is proportionate to population. So again, the smallest states have as few as three. California is the largest, and it's get gets 55 electoral votes. The 23rd Amendment to the Constitution granted three electoral votes to the District of Columbia as well. So that's been added to the total. Residents of the U.S. territories, the colonized territories that the U.S. continues to govern, and these include Guam, Puerto Rico, Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, and the U.S. Virgin Islands may not vote in the U.S. presidential elections, so people who are residents of those territories and are not separately U.S. citizens in another state uh, can't vote in the presidential election and uh, are not represented in the Electoral College, although they remain under U.S. rule and subject to many federal laws. Many of you already know that it takes 270 electoral votes to win and that there are, and, and some of you may also know that there are 538 electoral votes today. So 270 out of 538 votes constitutes a majority. It's basically 50% plus one. Those numbers could change over time with population change. So those are the current proportions. So I want to dig a little bit into the history. Why was the Electoral College enacted? It was understood as a compromise between having the president appointed by Congress or by the state legislatures and a true popular vote at the time. Some involved in the initial constitutional debates and discussions were concerned that, um, you know, in 
local spheres where people weren't always getting access to a lot of information, people wouldn't know how to vote on a national scale. But a deeper controversy, and some of you may be aware of this, was also that the southern states, and particularly those that were uh, slave owning, were concerned that if they joined the union, that they could simply be outvoted by a popular vote and the slave trade could be threatened. And so the Electoral College was established as a compromise in this respect as well, and how, as, as was the U.S. Senate, because they gave every state um, weighted representation in the Senate and in the Electoral College. So even those states that were very small that didn't have as much of the population still got two senators and still got two corresponding electoral votes. Since then, there have been at least 700 attempts, according to the organization Fair Fight, uh, which is maintained by Stacey Abrams in Georgia, to abolish the Electoral College. Again, that there have been 700 plus attempts to try to abolish the Electoral College, and everyone has failed. <coughs> Excuse me. The reason that they fail is because it the Electoral College is enshrined, enshrined in Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution. And as those of you who've been attending earlier sessions of the Civics Project know, we require a three-quarters rat ratification by state legislatures. So three-fourths of the state legislatures must ratify an amendment to the Constitution. Since there are a number of smaller states with smaller populations, the decision to abolish the Electoral College would mean that these states would then have less control over the election of the president. And so we've never hit that three-fourths majority that would be needed to take the Electoral College out of the Constitution to outright abolish it. I want to say a little bit more about the history. In the late 18th and early 19th century and through the end of the Civil War, electoral votes were calibrated to count the population so that every five enslaved persons counted as three people for the purposes of population count. This was also known as the three-fifths com compromise, and it was established in 1787 under the Constitutional Convention. It remained in place, these, this three-fifths compromise, until 1868, when it was uh, abolished by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. So prior to 1868, the two populations counted towards the electoral count, citizens who were free white persons and uh, enslaved persons, five of, for every five of whom three were counted. The consequence of this, at least according to some historians, is that it actually gave slave states a disincentive to free black people because if they did, they would lose a number of electoral votes. In other words, by keeping people enslaved, they gained more electoral votes. And the reason for that was tied up in the fact that being counted as a citizen was locked into being free and white. And so free black people were not adding to their electoral counts, at least for much of that period, whereas enslaved black people did. So one of the ways that this came into contention was about the question of could a free black person assert citizenship rights or personhood, and many mark the 1857 Court, U.S. Supreme Court decision, Dred Scott versus Sanford, as significant. Now, this case, I want to be clear, was not specifically about the Electoral College. It was about personhood. So Dred Scott was an enslaved person who was taken into a territory where slavery was not lawful, as I recall. Um, and I believe he was in the state of Illinois at the time. And when his slave master passed away, he, he attempted to contest his slavery rather than having himself and his family pass into um, by inheritance to the slave owner's family. Uh, so he was attempting to sue in court and assert his legal personhood. And the Supreme Court ultimately determined that he wasn't a person legally. He was proper property and property cannot sue. And so therefore they couldn't even hear the merits of his claim. Although 
practically speaking, they essentially did. So they asserted the lawfulness of slavery and the inability of any enslaved person to assert any legal rights in a court. As you can imagine, the decision was very deeply contested. This was close to the beginning of the Civil War, and it was contested in both popular and legal circles. I want to just briefly quote from the legal dissent by Justice Benjamin Curtis from 1857. So in other words, he was one of the Supreme Court justices who was hearing the case at the time, and he disagreed with the majority who ruled against Dred Scott's personhood and legal claim. And this is what he had to say. And what he was basically getting at, I'll I'll preface before I read his quote, was that he was saying that the court was just voting its own ideologies rather than adhering to the Constitution. So Curtis claimed when a strict interpretation of the Constitution is abandoned and the theoretical opinions of individuals are allowed to control its meaning, We have no longer a constitution. We are under the government of individual men who, for the time being, have power to declare what the constitution is according to their own views of what it ought to mean. So in essence, uh, Justice Curtis was saying people are just making whatever they want out of the constitution. And this, again, tends to be a continuing contemporary struggle. To what extent does the Constitution have any independent authority or is it simply at the whims of the Supreme Court? Regardless, however, the Dred Scott decision reinforced the reality that slave states were deeply incentivized not to enact anti-slavery laws because doing so would reduce their electoral votes. Black people only supplemented the electoral vote count while they remained enslaved. Contemporary critics continue to emphasize the role of the Electoral College in reinforcing racial inequity in voting. So 100 years after the 1857 Dred Scott decision in 1957, when arguing for voting restrictions which disfavored voters of color, William Buckley published his essay, Why the South Must Prevail. And he stated that white people in the United States are, quote, entitled to take such measures as are necessary to prevail, politically and culturally, anywhere they are outnumbered because they are part of the advanced race. Close quote. As the Voting Rights Act of, as the Voting Rights Act of 18, 1965 shifted electoral politics in the United States, the Electoral College remained untouched because of its enshrinement in the Constitution. So the Voting Rights Act started doing with a whole, doing away with a whole set of ways in which voting was intended, was intended to ensure white dominance in the electoral process. But the one area that the Voting Rights Act could not touch was the Electoral College. And again, they could not because the Voting Rights Act could be passed and enacted just on the will of Congress and the executive branch in 1965. But Congress and the executive branch do not have the power to change the Constitution without three-quarters ratification by state legislatures. And again, three-quarters of the states were unwilling to do so. So while areas of voting restriction, which were considered outdated, were falling by the wayside, the Electoral College remained. So how exactly does the Electoral College help maintain racial inequity in voting? The basic idea is that it provides additional voting power to small white dominated states. So it's about the makeup of race and geography in the United States. Many populations of color are disproportionately congregated in large urban areas, but absent a popular vote, the large populations of like black and Latinx and in some instances indigenous voters in states like California and New York have substantially less impact than they otherwise would. So to give you a concrete example, California represents 12.2% of the popular vote, but only gets 9.7% of the the electoral vote. So California loses 2.5% of its sway in the presidential election due to the electoral college. Let's contrast that with South Dakota which represents, it has less than a million people in the population. It's about 800,000, between 800 and 900,000. And it represents roughly 0.2% 
so a fifth of a percent of the U.S. population. But it gets half of a percent of the electoral votes, which is basically two and a half times its representation by population. South Dakota is 84.6 percent white as compared to California, which is 59.5 percent white. So what we see is that some of the populated currently blue states are losing these small but still significant percentages of their electoral clout, which are then being redistributed between in, into smaller red and in a few instances blue states. But the overall outcome is that a percentage of the electoral vote is essentially more heavily weighted in a way that favors the white population. Hopefully that made sense to everybody, and I'm glad to talk about it more with our Zoom audience. As a consequence, Wilfred U. Codrington III, when writing uh, as part of the Brennan Center for Justice, described the Electoral College in 2020 as the nation's oldest structural, structural racial entitlement program. So let's think about what difference would a popular vote make? Well, we wouldn't have had George W. Bush we wouldn't have had Donald Trump. Our Supreme Court would likely now be seven to two liberal or progressive justice justices versus right wing justices instead of what we have now, which is a six to three right wing versus liberal or progressive breakdown. So there's been one particular remedy that's been proposed and now been circulating in the United States for a number of years. And that's described as the national, or that's what's known as the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, or just sometimes the National Popular Vote Compact, the NPVC. The National Popular Vote Compact is an interesting and and fairly unique piece of legislation. It's the same basic text which state legislatures can, can choose to adopt, adopt. And what it stipulates is that the compact will only go into effect when enough state legislatures adopt it to count as 270 electoral votes. So once enough states have voluntarily adopted this piece of legislation and those states combined have at least 270 electoral votes, which is the number needed to pick the president, Then the NPVC goes into effect, and what it says is that each of these states will instruct their electors to vote with the national popular vote count regardless of their state vote count. So in other words, it basically has two um, states representing 270 electoral votes agreeing, we will elect whoever wins the popular vote. Now, it's not an effect, right? We still have the Electoral College governing our decisions. Uh, But the National Popular Vote Bill has been enacted now by 16 states and jurisdictions. And I specify jurisdictions because that includes the District of Columbia. And those jurisdictions together are in possession of 196 electoral votes. So they need 74 more to get to 270. The states that have already adopted it include Delaware, Hawaii, Rhode Island, Vermont, Colorado, Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington, California, Illinois, and New York, and the District of Columbia, as noted. The bill, however, has also made it through one but not both chambers in nine more states, and if all nine of those pass it, it would it would amount to another 88 electoral votes or 284 in, je- in total, which would definitely put the NPVC into effect. So those nine states, which have not passed it, but it has been passed in one chamber of their legislature, include Arkansas, Arizona, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Nevada, Oklahoma, and Virginia. So far, far, more than 3,000 state legislators across the 50 states have endorsed it. So it's definitely got building support each time I check in on it, like every year or two. It's got a few more, but still requires 74 more. Now, the National Popular Vote Bill will not abolish the Electoral College. It will just work around it. 
So in other words, it will get a critical number of states to say, we will instruct our electors, which under the Constitution is up to the states. So they, it will get those states to say, we will instruct our electors to go with the popular will of the nation. And in doing so, the Constitution and the Electoral College will stay exactly as it is. But the popular vote then would win as long as the NPVC remains in effect. Um, so I want to share a book recommendation for today, which is Stacey Abrams' Our Time is Now, Power, Purpose, and the Fight for a Fair America. And for our Zoom participants, I'll go ahead and put that book recommendation in the chat. And as many of you know, we also have our weekly civics trivia. And so I'm going to go ahead and share screen with our Zoom participants, but we'll also read the trivia for our uh, podcast audience. So we have three questions, and the first question is this. Which of the following politicians was quoted as saying the Electoral College is a disaster for democracy? And the choices are A, Kamala Harris, B, Bernie Sanders, C, Donald Trump, and D, Mitt Romney. Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, or Mitt Romney? And the correct answer on this one is C, Donald Trump. He actually tweeted this statement in 2012 before winning the presidency as a result of the Electoral College vote in 2016. Second question, can undocumented persons be counted as part of the population when determining electoral vote allotment today? No, never. Yes, since 1965. Yes, as of January 20th of 2021. The correct answer on this is C. Donald Trump had ordered by executive order during his presidency that the census should not count undocumented persons, which would have meant that undocumented people would also be left out of the population count for the purposes of, develop, of, of determining electoral votes. But Biden overturned that order on Inauguration Day. It was one of the first ones he signed two months ago, or less than two months ago, January 20th of 2021. So undocumented persons had counted before and do count again and will count in the recording of the 2020 U.S. Census. Last question. How many U.S. presidents have lost the popular vote but won the presidency via the Electoral College? And the choices are three, four, five, and six. And the right answer is four. And for those of you who joined us earlier in our first sessions, you might remember us talking about John Quincy Adams, who lost both the popular and electoral votes in 1925 to uh, Andrew Jackson, but nevertheless was appointed by Congress. And the reason that that was possible, or elected by Congress, and the reason that that was possible because was because there were four different presidential candidates and although Andrew Jackson had won more votes than any other in both the popular and electoral count, he had not won a majority of the votes in total. And in that situation in the early 19th century, the, the election of the president then defaulted to the House of Representatives. However, we don't actually count John Quincy Adams in that answer because he... Um, because he did not uh, win the popular or the electoral vote count. He actually won as a result of congressional election. So there are four presidents who lost the popular vote, but won the electoral count. The first was Rutherford B. Hayes in 1876, not long after Benjamin Harrison in 1888, very close race. Then George W. Bush in 2000 and Donald Trump in 2016. Uh, so we had more than a century before the 2000 Bush election in which the popular vote and the electoral vote kept matching up. And now that we've had two presidents in a row win office uh, 
in in spite of the popular vote, it's increased, I think, public dissatisfaction with the Electoral College as an archaic institution. So some places you can learn more are posted for our Zoom audience, and I'll also put them in the chat. And I want to thank our podcast audience for turning in today. I'll be having some further conversation with live folks, but I hope everybody will rejoin us uh, next week for a session on the federal budget, which is an incredibly important subject right now as we're looking at a deficit that's climbing up to $30 trillion. And uh, then again on March 21st, that Sunday, for our session on citizenship, which features our special guest, Hiroshi Motomura, who is the faculty director of the Center for Immigration Law and Policy at at UCLA. Uh, So I hope that you will continue to listen, continue to join us, and I will look forward to more civics.